Language is computed inside your head by neurons. But what exactly is human language? How does it make us different from other animals? What I want to show you today is that language is grounded on three specific core computations inside your brain, driven by a single underlying computational engine, just like your laptop CPU. Importantly, I also want to show you today the computer systems that claim to have captured these special computations so far have failed to do so, despite what you might have heard otherwise. So let's begin with something simple. It's an example illustrating human language's first core computation. I've shown it this way as a row of six red and green balls. Now we can imagine someone asking, pick up the second green ball. Note there's a ambiguity here, a choice, because you could pick up the second of all the green balls, that's ball number three, this one, or you could pick up the second ball and see that it also happens to be green, ball number two. That's two different answers. But what do people actually do? If you know English, you always select ball number three. But the question is, why? Children do this reflexively ages, at, by ages three to five. And the answer is that children and adults unconsciously follow this first core computation of human language. They compute reflexively in their heads a hierarchical structure that looks like a stack of triangles associated with the string of words. I schematically show that to the right by this white triangle here. The triangle groups green and ball together as shown by this green circle. So is it in effect looking for the set of all the green balls? And when we add the larger circle to it, indicated by the red, that encompasses the previous one. Note that to represent the sentence in their brains, the children just pay attention to the hierarchical structure alone. They throw away, they ignore the linear order of the words, even though that's what we hear. If the language were Japanese, as I show at the bottom of this slide on the left, children construct the same stacked set of hierarchical triangles as before in English, but with different words. And the stack looks like the mirror image of the one in English, but they get the same meaning. So that's the first core computation of human language. We can say it this way. What reaches the ear is ordered in time from left to right, but what reaches the mind or brain is unordered from left to right. It's actually, actually hierarchical. We can make these internal triangles in the brain visible using direct electrophysiological measurements of the brain as it processes sentences. And I show this on this slide here. In an experiment, an experiment done in 2015, Ding et al. had Chinese human subjects listen to sentences like the one that's shown at the top here. It's labeled here, dry fur, rub skin, new plans, give hope, with a hierarchical structure as I'm going to indicate by the red triangles. Chinese subjects' brains produce these corresponding hierarchical electrical patterns that are shown on the bottom here with these peaks that align with the language up at the top. Thus, the brain actually pulsates in time to the formation of these hierarchical triangles, as you can see by the way they're juxtaposed. Consider one final example, the sentence, English eagles that fly instinctively swim. This sentence is ambiguous. The adverb instinctively can modify either fly describing how the eagles fly, or it can modify swim, indicating how eagles swim. Now, suppose we change this sentence just a little. So we have it here. We move instinctively to the front. With this change, the sentence is no longer ambiguous. Instinctively can only modify swim. What this shows is that instinctively does not modify the verb that it is closest to, fly but rather one that it's actually, it turns out to be hierarchically closest to swim. 
the brain ignores linear distance. That's core computation one. Okay, but what about other animals or computers? Can they build triangles in their brains like people do? It doesn't appear that they can. Consider perhaps the most serious effort to teach a non-human animal a human language. In this case, American Sign Language. This is with the chimpanzee Nim, who received intensive training from birth. And here we have a picture of Nim, that's the person on the left, being taught by Laura Petito, the person on the, the right. After this training, Nim could string several signs together like a laundry list, but had no way to construct something like second green ball or understand it. Nim would just prattle on until he would happen on a sign sequence that led the human experimenter to give the reward that Nim wanted. Note Lim, Nim's longest sign below. Give orange, me, give orange, me, eat orange, give. You get the idea. Nim wanted an orange. But it's simply a long set of beads on a string. It's not hierarchical triangles. So while Lim had about the same auditory system as humans, he never could acquire a language in the same way that children do. Let's see briefly now whether modern computer systems can do better than NIM and actually capture this kind of hierarchical computation. And we'll return to that theme at the conclusion of the talk. Because there's been much news over the past decade and how much better the new style artificial intelligence neural networks are in analyzing human languages that they can come very close to what we do. I'll give you some evidence now that in fact, quite the opposite is true, using our second green ball example. In the picture I show here, this is how Google's best AI neural network system deals with something like pick up the second green ball. It's the representation and outputs. Note that it explicitly does not build hierarchical structure. Rather, it's all flat. There are no stacked triangles, what children do. Instead, it analyzes second green ball in a linear string-like way. So arriving at the meaning that it should first look at the second ball and then see what happens. So the Google parser doesn't work on this. Let's turn now to the second core computation of human language, what can be called digital infinity. Digital because there are no three and there are three and four word sentences, but no three and a half word sentences. And infinity because we can construct infinitely many thoughts in our minds and can convey to others with no access to our minds their innermost workings. Since the number of sentences we can speak are infinite, we can't explicitly list them all. The brain is finite. So how can we construct an infinity of possible thoughts? In the 19th century, William von Humboldt put the matter this way, that language makes infinite use of finite means, a finite brain, infinite possible behaviors and sentences output. No other animals do this. The sentence I show here from Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code, might be called the infinite misuse of finite means, but nonetheless, a very complicated sentence, almost inconceivably, the gun into which she was now staring, and so on. Okay? Now, how can we construct all these hierarchically structured expressions, an infinite number of them? What is the computation that lies behind this ability? Until the 1930s and the advent of computation, we didn't understand how that, that could possibly be done. But now we do. We understand the only way that a finite brain can do this is it has to have some kind of operation or computation that applies to its own output. That's the, an essential property of human language that I call the basic property. It's a property that's sometimes called recursive. That's what it means for something to apply to its own output. So if some recursive structure building operation is required for human language to build stacked triangles in the brain, we can actually now describe it. And I've shown it here on this slide. 
we can call it the computational operation merge. So I show at the top, what merge does is take two elements like eight apples, X and Y, and it can glue them together to form a new larger structure. That's the union of X and Y, a hierarchical structure. Merge can then apply to its own output. Here's the output here. It can apply again recursively and can construct a larger structure. Bob ate apples. Notice that could have just as well been Bob apples ate in Japanese. Remember, the linear order doesn't matter. So this merge operation, grinding along, gluing elements together, is the human brain's CPU for language, the simplest possible combinatorial operator that can generate all the possible human sentence triangles we need. And it doesn't seem to be present in any other animals besides us. It makes us special. Merge also leads directly to the third and final core computation of human language, what we can call movement. And I've depicted this here on this slide. We said before that merge is defined as joining two elements together, like eight and apples. So there are two logical possibilities here. Either those two elements are disjoint and have nothing in common with each other, like eight and apples. In this case, we say y and x, the two elements are, are disjoint and we can form eight apples. That's one possibility. Or it's the case that y is a subset of x. So we illustrate that second possibility where y is a subset of x on this slide, starting with the triangle representation for Bob ate what. Next, we can observe, we could take y to be the innermost element circled in red, and x to be the entire set of stack triangles circled in yellow. Then y is, of course, inside the yellow circle. It's a subset. If I apply merge to this, I get the following output shown here. What Bob ate what? When this gets spoken in English, the second occurrence of what at the very end is not pronounced. And one adds some kind of marker to mark tense. So we get something that looks like this. We get, what did Bob eat? That is a familiar question, where what is the understood object of what it is that was eaten, even though it's only pronounced at the beginning of the sentence and not the end. This is movement. It's commonplace in most of the world's languages. In short, with just this very simplest imaginable combination of machinery that we need to get digital infinity at all, as a free bonus, we also get the possibility of sentences where an item can be pronounced, what, at the front of a sentence, distinct from where it's interpreted at the end of a sentence. This possibility of dual positions of appearance and interpretation is unlike any programming language, but it's widespread in human language. And that's the third core computation of human language. To conclude, let's see whether these computer systems that we now have for analyzing human language, so-called deep neural networks, can mirror these three core human language computations. Such systems, you may know, are trained on billions of examples, essentially the entire web. So it's unsurprising that they can successfully parrot back many useful things. However, more surprisingly, they do not seem to reflect what human neural networks do. And they actually fail to capture any of the three core computations completely. So let's take a look at this. First, as we've seen, they fail to build hierarchical structure in examples like the second green ball, where children and adults always build the hierarchical structures. We repeat here how Google neural network system analyzes this example incorrectly. Second, they don't seem to accurately use merge, this basic 
operator, the CPU of human language, to generate digital infinity, as we show here in the second figure, which shows how Google's parser system handles instinctively eagles that fly swim. Instead of associating instinctively with swim, the Google system unfortunately pairs it up with eagles. It doesn't even pick out swim to be a verb. The neural network system has jumbled everything up. Third, and finally, neural network systems stumble at the third core property computation of language, movement. We illustrate this in the last row on the slide with the example, what did Bob want to eat? That's only just a little bit more complicated than the example we used before. What did Bob eat? Where we put what at the front of the sentence in English, even though it usually belongs immediately after eat as the object. So what does the Google system do here? Well, crucially, it cannot figure out at all what what is actually supposed to be doing, that it's the object of eat. It's, that's indicated by the label that's on what. If you look at that label, it says DEP, DEP, which is what it labels something when it can't figure out what that word has to do in the sentence at all. So while the neural net network can figure out the simple example, what did Bob eat, it is stumped by even a slightly more complicated one that no child would ever get wrong. So by age three or five, children can all answer these kinds of questions correctly, but the Google system trained on billions of examples cannot. So what do we conclude from this? I think we can conclude that whatever else these deep neural network systems are doing, they've not really absorbed these three core computations of language. The word neural might be part of their names, but the resemblance to what human brains compute with language ends there. Now that's a sobering thought for those in the field, I think, but I, it's also a golden opportunity to go beyond what we do today to build a computer system that actually does respect the core computations of human language. These computations are the true scientific goal of the study of language. The computational fingerprint of syntax in the brain and what makes us uniquely human.